Hello, my name is Alexandr Fudulov. I'm a solutions architect with Viverica. This is the first video in a series where we will introduce the Apache Flink framework. We will go over the basics, but also look into some more advanced topics and peek a bit under the hood. To set the stage today, I would like to start with a general topic of stateful stream processing. We will talk about how it relates to batch processing and where the need for it comes from. First, a couple of words about Viverica. Viverica is a company that was founded by the original creators of Apache Flink. It was founded in Berlin in 2014 and became a subsidiary of the Alibaba Group at the beginning of 2019. It employs many of the core contributors of Apache Flink and, among other things, takes an active part in Flink's community-driven development process. What is Apache Flink? Apache Flink is an open source framework for processing large amounts of data. It has focus on low latency and high throughput. It is a distributed system and supports horizontal scaling. Flink is also a stateful system. This means that it allows persisting intermediate processing results internally without using external components. At the same time, what is very important in the case of distributed systems, it has built-in fault tolerance. Even if one of the machines where your Flink application runs fails, no data will be lost and the results will remain consistent. In terms of integration, Flink has connectors for a diverse range of components, ranging from message brokers to file systems and databases. Flink gained large adoption it is widely spread both geographically and in terms of diversity of application scenarios. Such companies as Netflix, Airbnb, eBay, and many others trust Flink for a variety of business critical applications. Flink is a very active open source project. According to the statistics of the Apache Software Foundation, it held leading positions in 2019 when measured by such important metrics as the mailing list traffic, and the number of commits. As I said at the beginning, this video will be devoted to a general topic of stream processing. So what is stream processing? Stream processing is a somewhat overloaded term. Maybe something related to video streaming could come to your mind if you hear it for the first time. This is not what we mean in the context of big data. This term exists in the domain of distributed systems, and it first kind of appeared in this field as a way to contrast with the term batch processing. So in order to understand what is stream processing, we'll need to first clarify how it compares to the more traditional batch processing approach. How does batch processing work? Let's say we have some kind of data creation process. As the time progresses, we constantly accumulate new entries. This could be, for instance, click events from web servers. In the traditional batch processing approach, as these events arrive, they are logged into files. Everything that happens within a certain duration of time, let's say one hour, is logged into some active file. When the hour is over, the file is closed and the logging starts in the next hour file. And so on. In other words, we cut our data into pieces, into large chunks. Now, suppose we operate an online shop and we would like to analyze our user's activity. Let's assume we need to analyze all the interactions from the moment when the user put the first item in the shopping cart till the moment when the payment was made. In case of batch processing, with a certain frequency, for instance hourly, a scheduler will invoke processing of the last recorded file and produce the results, one hour after another. This approach works, but it has some serious drawbacks. So, on the fundamental level, the process of data creation is continuous. Data is constantly coming into the system and we, ourselves, decided to cut the data into pieces and process them once an hour. This leads, first and foremost, to delayed results. Maybe we could have 
immediately learn something very specific from the user session and influence the purchase decision, decision in a certain case, but we are likely to miss this opportunity. By the time the results are ready, the user most likely already left the website and closed their session. The second problem is that we provoke an artificially spiky load. We postpone the computation up until the last moment and then try to process everything at once. This usually requires over-provisioning of resources in order to get the results of the computation in a timely manner. But there's one more problem. And it can be seen even as a more critical one. Uh, this is so because it is related to the correctness of the results. What happens if the session starts at the very end of the hour and all of the main user's actions happen at the beginning of the next one? The analysis of the session will be lost. It will be incorrect. What is the conceptual underlying issue? During the processing of each segment, a certain transient state is built up. The problem is that we completely forget it prior to starting processing of the next segment, as if we believed it is no longer relevant. Although we can clearly see that there is actually a state transfer that has to happen between our artificially created data boundaries. In order to correct the results, we often resort to subsequent refinements. In this case, we could try to fix the inconsistencies at the end of the day by running the same batch process on all of the 24 hourly segments. This allows us to correct the errors between the hourly buckets, but the same problem persists at the border of the two adjacent days. So to say, the different resolution level. This refinement process, of course, doesn't come for free, and it only amplifies the spiky load issue mentioned earlier. So with all those issues, how can we do better? And the answer is with stream processing. Instead of the artificial boundaries that we create in batch processing, let's look at the problem as it is. That we need to have a long running computation that actually matches that continuous data creation process. That we have a potentially unlimited input data stream and that each event can change the status of the system in real time, one event at a time. In batch, we accumulate the state during the calculation of the segment, but forget it as soon as we start processing the next batch. In streaming, we don't do this. We take care of the system's long-lasting status. In this case, in order to ensure the consistent results of the computation and provide strict output delivery guarantees, the task of preserving the state and ensuring its correctness must be taken over by the data processing framework. From this, you can immediately see that one of the most critical aspects of stream processing is how the state is managed. This task becomes especially challenging when we have not only one machine, but we want to achieve consistent state processing in a distributed system, which performs computation in parallel and can be horizontally scaled. We will look into how Flink addresses state fault tolerance in subsequent videos, but first, Let's take a look at a couple of use cases that are enabled by this different approach. The first category of use cases is streaming ETL. The example with aggregating the online store events that we have looked at before could fall into this category. ETL usually implies that you have some well-defined data transformation process. It could be data aggregation, data enrichment, or some simple transformations. Important distinction to the traditional ETL is that data is being processed as soon as it arrives. This makes it possible to avoid the shortcomings of batch processing that we've looked at in the previous slides. The second category of use cases is so-called streaming analytics. In contrast to ETL, here we imply some more exploratory ad hoc nature of the executed computations. The target audience is data analysts and data scientists who need to extract new insights out of the incoming data in real time. Results are then often used to build dashboards that highlight important business metrics or even steer and optimize some automated processes. The third category of use cases of uh, event-driven applications is very interesting because 
stream processing actually allows to change and simplify how you could traditionally approach building a very broad range of applications. Specifically, applications where you would typically use a transactional database to store your application's intermediate state. Let's look into this use case in some more details. Let's say you have some application that gets input data, reads some state from the database, and updates it according to some logic and that input. Very often, the full set of capabilities of a database is not actually utilized. The database is frequently used merely to push the state fault tolerance problem from the application domain to the database domain. Databases are hard to scale and they often become a bottleneck when processing large amounts of data. You also have to pay the penalty of going over the network for each and every input record. Imagine for a second that you would not need to do that. That you could have your state locally, but also not worry about machines going down and losing your data. This is what Flink can provide you with. It gives you not only convenient API abstractions, but also access to a key-based fault-tolerant data storage. And you can easily scale this storage together with your application. This is a very powerful approach that can be applied in a broad range of use cases, from low latency fraud detection to the on-the-fly feature engineering for machine learning algorithms. This concludes our introductory video. In the next video, we'll take a look at what a Flink program looks like and how, and how Flink addresses the critical aspects of achieving fault-tolerant data processing in a distributed system.